Waiatea Fifth Estate is brought to you by ACU, the Aotearoa Credit Union. Good Aotearoa, welcome to Waiatea Fifth Estate, where we wrap the most important news events with the best political panel on television. Joining us tonight for our infamous Friday night political wrap of the week. <laughs> co-leader of the co-leader of the Maori Party, Madame Fox. Unionist and activist Mike Treen, winner of Best Columnist at the Canon Media Awards, the brilliant Rachel Stewart, and political commentator, blogger and mana movement candidate John Minto. Thank you for joining this panel. And remember viewers, you can send in questions and thoughts of tonight's show off the watianews.com and dailyblog.nz platforms, or you can email us on watia 5 e at watia 603amconz Tonight's guest Twitter commentator is Laquisha St. Redfern. Follow them tonight using the hashtag Watia Fifth Estate. The top three issues of the week tonight are... Uh, issue one. Have public departments like Mental Health, SIFS, Housing New Zealand and WINS started hurting those who use them more than help them? Issue two, Winston Peters on interviewing every migrant to make sure they don't have negative attitudes towards women. Issue three, how do we get affordable homes and eradicate homelessness when so many New Zealanders are half a trillion in debt from property speculation? And we'll wrap the show with a final word from our panellists, but let's get stuck into issue one. Week after week, we have news stories showing departments like WINS, Mental Health Services, Housing New Zealand and SIFS, Agencies set up to look after our most vulnerable are in fact harming the people they are supposed to be looking after. What has gone so horrifically wrong in our social services? Marama, last week we heard about Ashley Peacock who has been locked up for five years in an isolated cell and stuck there because there is no funding. How does isolating and locking the mentally <coughs> unwell up help those people and their whanau? It doesn't. That's an easy answer. It doesn't help them. And you're absolutely right. And it's not that we've just started. We've been on this slippery soap for a number of years. The number of corruption issues that I have with SIFs, Housing New Zealand being the biggest slumlord in the country, it just goes on and on. How is it that we've gotten to a situation <coughs> where these departments, which we say your mandate is to look after the most vulnerable, look after the weakest, they're actually creating situations far worse for the people than when they actually entered the system. Look, if you are a SIFS child, and I've seen all the data now as part of the SIFS review, yep, yep. you immediately go to the bottom of every single disparaging statistic in this country. You will be more likely to go to jail, more likely to leave school without yeah, a qualification, yeah. more likely to die earlier, more likely to have some chronic illness. Yeah. And you did nothing wrong yeah. except be a possibly born to a couple of drop kicks or not, because actually we're even alienating children from parents who have done nothing yeah, wrong. Yeah. It is that bad and it, it deserves to be ripped apart and restructured completely. We have a suicide rate, um, Marama, that, that, that is stratospheric and mental health services fractured and splintered and unable to help the people who need it. How does a system that's in crisis help people who are in crisis? Uh, well, again, it's not. Uh, and, and suicide is, I've had so many people, women, who are trying to get off the drugs that they've been given to cope with their depression, which is mm. making them suicidal on, in mm. itself. Mm. Mm. Then they go to ED and are turned away. They go to ED to say, I don't think I can trust myself being at home yep. tonight. Yep. I want to go into crisis respite care. Yep. And they are being turned away from ED. It makes no sense. I've been in Auckland today talking with different groups, um, and been asking the minister, I've got appointments with psychiatrists, say, how is this your best model of care yeah. for people who are in danger of taking their own lives? Yeah. It just is wrong. We talked to the Nutters um, uh, Club uh, a couple of weeks ago. They said that talking to the experts there, not the experts, sorry, the, the bureaucrats there, uh, and asking, what is an acceptable apparent, uh, period of time for a callback? And, 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 and they were told six weeks. Wow. Six weeks. Wow. That's an emergency case. Wow. 
That is ridiculous. Listen, we when last year we get to put in bu budget bids yeah, as yeah. part of the Māori yeah, Party. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the majority of that money goes to the Māori Development Minister and, and TPK. Yeah. So then I get one bid and they say, Marama, what's your highest priority? And I said, well, geez, it, it has to be saving people's lives. I got one bid in for a tiny bit of money for suicide prevention. But what we did is we went round the country, we focused it on rangatahi Māori because yep. uh, those are where the highest yeah, rates are. Yeah, yeah. And we found amazing programs going on around the country that we are now going just about to roll out. Some of them have got so their So we can fix support. things, right? I mean, that's that's the essence. We can Look, fix things. in Northland, they had 32 suicides in a very short period of time. At the same time, they found four men guilty of over 200 cases of assault of sexual abuse yeah, yeah, now yeah. rife right yeah. and so in northland 32 cases they put in a group up there that are doing amazing things that completely halted that suicide run at so well that they didn't even exhaust the amount of money and support that was given to them so there are programs that work but they're grassroots they're not this system yeah, that yeah. has been set up and is failing our people rachel the sifts report astonishingly suggests children are more at risk, more at risk of being harmed in state care than in the general public. How is that anything other than a disgrace? Well, it fits with, it, it fits with what's happening in other um, ministries that I'm watching very closely. And this may sound like an aside, but if you think about the Ministry for the Environment, if you think mm. about MPI, if you think about DOC, mm. MPI are letting people rape and pillage the sea and, you know, that's all covered up. Mm. Ministry for the Environment allowing irrigation. Um, DOC are failing, taking money from Fonterra just to keep operating. Mm. Um, so it's a it's a neoliberal progression. It's, it's something that's getting worse under this government. It's something that we've had around since the 80s, to be honest. Yep. But it's getting worse. And then you talk about suicide. Well, Yes, it's it's it is absolutely diabolical, and I think about farmers, of course, mm, who are yeah, also yeah, out there right. topping themselves that's because, right. again, these systems are failing them too. So you got the people who are up, you know, at the top, and the people at the bottom. I think we're all getting failed, and everybody in the middle too. Rachel, has our public infrastructure been underfunded purposely to make privatisation look better? Is that what's going on? Oh, I, I think so. But I, again, I say it went back to the eighties under, you know. Raw genomics, probably. Um, but yes, definitely, you see a pattern emerging. It's a bad pattern. It's a pattern of underfunding everybody so they fall over and they can't function. So yes, it's it's a terrible thing, and it's affecting every New Zealander, every single one of us, but particularly the poor. Mike, 60% uh, of solo parents and job seeker beneficiaries owe wins. They owe wins money from overpayment or from Windsor's voodoo equa relationship equation. How is getting into debt with the state, how is that helping those beneficiaries? Well, clearly it's not. Um, what, you, what you have had happen over the last 10 or 15 years is a radical reduction in the proportion of the unemployed who are able to access a benefit. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, I've looked at this very closely, and today it's something like half of the number that would normally be able to access benefits. So, so in, the, in the 80s and yeah, 90s, yeah. there was, a, there was a, a clear correlation between the level of unemployment and the level of people on benefits. Yeah. There was a radical change occurred, actually under a Labour government. Yes. It began under a Labour government, but a radical mm -hmm. change occurred in the uh, in the in that sort of two, mid mid to late 2000s, yep. and that relationship between the number of people who are unemployed and the number of people accessing benefits changed radically. I estimate there's something like a hundred thousand people out there in the community with a billion dollars a year that's not going into the community yep, that yep, would have got yep. it in the past. Now the way they did it was by a policing regime in Winds that That's treated right. every single person trying to access a benefit, not as somebody who had an entitlement, but somebody who was trying to steal from the yes. system. Yes. So they were being treated like criminals. They were being treated as they were cheats and so on, and people gave up, and people were forced off benefits and gave up, yeah. and, 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 and accessing what used to be entitlements were turned into, into, into rights. So if you needed emergency assistance, it became a debt. Yes. If you needed housing, it's like the absurd situation, people needing emergency housing, that they are, that they are being put into a motel and, and, and given a debt. Yeah. This system is mad. It's not based on rights, it's based 
on treating people like they are, like, like they are the enemy, and there has to, has to be a radical change in culture for, 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 for something to happen. You want to jump in? Yeah, yeah I just it. want to jump in there because um, it, it was astounding to me that they were racking up these debts to motels because the state has failed to provide adequate housing provision for our people. So um, I went to both ministers and mm. said, this is ridiculous. Mm. You can wipe your inland revenue debt. You can have inland revenue fraud and get off uh, with a that's fine right, or with a something, right, right. but actually for um, welfare benefit debt, you are jailed. Because how are they going to pay that That's right, but guess debt? what I found out? Guess what I found out? The minister herself told me that um, managers and wins have discretion now to wipe debt well, and why, don't do why it. Why is that only now? Exactly. Jesus. Exactly. Uh, Mike, our, our prison population is hitting 10,000 and our prisons are actually becoming less reforming. They, they, they've dropped the ball in terms of reforming prisoners. Are we building prisons that all they do now is actually make future prisoners? No, uh, that's obvious. It's probably been obvious for, for, for some decades. It's what's, what's politically uh, possible to try and change. This government, uh, uh, at least from the Minister of Finance, you can see a, a, um, a, a growing sensitivity as to the cost that's associated right. with the prison right. population. So they, so, they, so, they, so they establish some targets for the reduction of the prison population. But you, it's absurd to do that when you then pass laws that result in increased prison population. So they pass laws that where people who are not guilty, who are simply charged with an offence, can no longer access... E legal aid, yeah. Or no, yeah. no longer access um, um, being, you know, uh, you know they are jailed in the pretrial. Mm. They've made mm. it much more difficult mm. to get bail. These yep. are people yep. who have been charged with an offence but not convicted. So sure, the ones, are in, ones who are seriously violent at risk, but they've, they've established much broader categories for keeping people in jail. Now, of course, the, the cost is going to keep going up. And there's no, there's very little drug rehabilitation. There's very yep. little literacy. Yep. There's very no. little, That's right. very little training. There's That's very right. little of anything that occurs in prison. Yep. So what are you going to do? You're just going to, you're just going to, it's just going to be a recycling system uh, uh, to produce more prisoners. It's, uh, it's a, I don't, I, on one level, I don't understand because it doesn't make sense to me economically. They, right. you, you look at some of the Scandinavian countries and they, they adopted a bipartisan approach to reduce prison numbers, yep. change the laws, and and put in, put in all sorts of support mechanisms and achieve radical reductions in the prison numbers. We need a bipartisan approach. We can't have it. We can't have competing, the parties competing for who can be toughest on crime because there is it no fails. winner That's in right. that. John, no winner. John, um, State Housing New Zealand <laughs> returned over $100 million to the government. Should we be making money out of the poor? No, ab absolutely not. Um, I think that, that money comes actually from the pockets of, of state house tenants who pay their rent every week. Uh. That, that money should not be used to, to, to balance the government's books or to, you know, to, for, the, for the sort of corporate welfare which uh, seems to dominate um, the, the national government's approach. And uh, if I just make two comments, I think what we're doing um, with, in housing and in other areas the, the welfare state has been turned into, into, a, into a, an instrument to demean and demonise people on, on, on benefits. And I think that's absolutely appalling compared to what it was, it was set up for. Mm. And, but I think the, mo the more important thing that we need to think about is that um, is look at it from the other point of view. I mean, I, I have enormous faith in, in ordinary families mm. right the way around the country to look after their kids, to be able to... Um, uh, uh, care for them, care for themselves, care for their communities, provided they have the resources to do that, provided the jobs are there. But we've got an economy that's geared towards making the rich richer, and it's been very successful in doing that, and strip out money from low and middle income families. So what, I'm, what I think we need to do, if, if we cut through everything, is to say we need to put full employment, I mean 100%, not 99, not 95, 100% employment at the heart of our economic policy. If we did that, we would see dramatic reductions in all of the social problems which we're talking about today. Amen. Thank you, panel. We need to move on to issue two. In the wake of the Memorandum of Understanding that suggested New Zealand First has bled a lot of protest vote away to Labour, Winston Peters has decided to go on an immigration warpath. 
suggesting some cultures treat women like dogs and therefore we should slash immigration numbers. Force all new migrants to salute the flag. I'm not joking that he actually wants that. And, and, and in turn, uh, 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 does it uh, and interview them to make sure that they don't have any negative views towards women. Rachel, this is a brilliant idea by Winston, but I don't think he goes far enough. Yes, we should interview every migrant for their views on women right after we interview every New Zealand male first because our domestic violence rates are pretty horrific. And if Winston wants to sort of challenge rape culture, we should probably start here in New Zealand first, shouldn't we? Yeah, you just stole my line. That was exactly what I was going to say. In fact, they should probably start with interviewing every um, national party MP. Um, they should probably should start with the All Blacks. Um, there's a number of people they could go through. Um, but yes, yeah. so I find this outrageously crazy. I mean, you know, it's uh, New Zealand's got you know the biggest domestic violence rate in the OECD, and here's Winston talking about that. You know, I love the man, but you know, I also occasionally just shake my head and think, oh my god. So. You know, interesting stuff. I hope he learns to pull his head in before the next election. Manama, beyond the dog whistle, the obvious dog whistle, and the saluting the flag nonsense. I mean, how would they do that? God, everyone's got to, everyone's got to salute. New Zealanders <laughs> won't even salute the flag. Exactly right. But yeah. but there is real debate, is there not, to be had here about our unending immigration patterns right now? What the hell's going on? Listen, New Zealand can afford to have fifty thousand people come into New Zealand annually as long as they're not coming to Auckland. You, Auckland is at 97% capacity mm. full, mm. all rental, mm. all housing. Mm. And if it's that full, how can you how can you manage to have another 26,000 net migration into Auckland? Mm. But actually, um, migrant numbers into the regions, because um, if you're a migrant, you're coming with money, you're coming with something, you're coming to be able to set up stuff, yep. or you're returning home, yep. or you're a, a, you're a foreign student. Yep. So actually what we need to have is caps on where they go. Yep. Because if you are if you want to attract foreign students but you don't have the adequate provision to house them, yep. then you should be capped yep. on where they go. Mike, the government have no intention of tightening the immigration flow because they need it to prop up the property bubble, don't they? Well, they're, they're terrified with the about what is going to happen to yeah. the property bubble, and it is a bubble, yeah. and, and there will be a collapse in prices. The level will depend on the economic shock that triggers it. So, yep. um, But th there will definitely be some sort of correction in the future. They have also, but they've also relied on the property bubble to sustain the economy over yeah. the last yeah. few years yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, and to... And to pretend that the that the overall employment and economic situation is better yep. than it is by yep. using a significant flow of migrants and visitors. You see, the, you see, the government has complete control over this. There is almost uh, a potentially unlimited number of people that could be allowed in. Sure. So, sure. so from China or India, all you have to do is open the valve a little or close yep. the valve a yep. little, and that's what they've been doing. But, but more significantly, they haven't been allowing, they haven't significantly increased the number of people who have been able to access the country and become permanent residents. No, Those numbers, no. so what, are, what has been happening? What has been happening is they have created a layer of hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people who are here on, on temporary work visas yeah. and student visas. Mm. So these are people who have no, almost no rights, um, right. and, uh, 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 and they're often tied with them to employers, and that's why we're seeing such widespread and systematic abuse of migrant workers, yes. and it occurs yeah. in yeah. key sectors yeah. of the yeah. economy. Yeah. They want a free market to occur in all parts of the economy except the labour market. Yep. So, so, they, so it's okay for, for Filipinos to go and work in Southland dairy farms even if it's a scam. Right. Even when they discover that there's a whole scam associated with it in yep. terms of the qualifications and all the rest of it, legalise it, it's the dairy farmers. And they, so they want people working for a pittance uh, and, and, and all on minimum wage jobs for their mates. Because so they it works for them, they, that's yeah, right. It's, it works for their system. John, and how do we discuss immigration without it denigrating into xenophobia? Oh, that's a that's a that's a big question. Um, I think if you look at, at the debate in in the, in the US, um, you know, with with say you know Donald Trump um, versus Bernie Sanders, you can see where New Zealand will head, 
um, when we get into more economic difficulty, the, 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 the successful um, parties, uh, political parties, will be those that can frame the debate um, uh, around around who's to blame. And so um, if you can blame the, the, the immigrants, then that's a shift to the right, and that's the Donald Trump approach. Yep. If you can blame the economic structures and you can point to the fact that the utter failure of the capitalist system we have at the moment, then that's a win for the, for the, for the left. So I think how that debate gets framed is important. I, I'd just like to comment on what Mike said. I mean, I might think Mike's absolutely right about this. You know, the government wants a free market everywhere except in immigration. Yeah. You know, if you are a Southland dairy farmer, and you want someone to work on your farm, and you can't get anyone to work, what do you do in, in, a, in, a, in a market? What do you do? You frickin' pay more money for it. Yeah. You pay more money to those workers. Yeah. It, but we've got people, um, you know, we've got horticulturists around the, around the country who do not want to pay anything more than the minimum wage. They don't want to pay travel allowance. They don't want to pay anything. They want, <laughs> they want a, a, a supply of cheap labour to come in from the outside. These are jobs that New Zealanders could do, and if we had... Um, a market, you know, if the market was working, the New Zealanders would be paid far more to do the jobs than than, than the, the migrant workers are being paid at the moment and being exploited for. All right, thank you, panel. We need to move on to issue three. How do we get affordable homes and eradicate homelessness when so many New Zealanders are half a trillion, half a trillion people in debt from property speculation? Madam, my eye-opening series this week in the New Zealand Herald showing half a trillion in debt has been clocked up by speculators believing they are multi-millionaires. How do you convince those New Zealanders to care about housing affordability for the poor when they are frightened and leveraged up to their eyeballs in this? Absolutely. Now, and, and this is the point, actually, that it's not about um, migrants coming in and buying up lots of houses. It's not even about foreign investors from overseas buying up heaps of houses. What is happening in New Zealand is that mum and dad investors are, don't have enough money to put away for their retirement no, when, they're, no. when they're young with a family. Yep. When they get to a point where they can, they use the equity in their home and buy another one mm -hmm. or two mm -hmm. or three houses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's their retirement savings. Yeah. Their kids can't afford to get into the home ownership. Yep. So then they put their kids into those homes right. who then rent it and at some point will then take it over, yeah. right? So this is people looking after their retirement sure. because they don't make enough money when they're young to put away for it at that point. So what are we gonna do? Do we say, oh, we put a capital gains on all of that when actually people are just trying to save for their retirement? Yep. Or do we put a capital gain after you've, uh, after two houses or yep. after three houses? Something has to be done. Yes. But actually this bubble that we're talking about with the high house prices going up has been driven by our own population. Absolutely. Rachel, these numbers and stats are ringing alarm bells. Westpac, BNZ and ANZ have willingly stopped giving loans to non-resident buyers. I've never seen an ungreedy banker. So such reassembly of their balance sheets is pretty concerning, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the banks are being more cautious than our own government. I mean, so... Doesn't that terrify about, you? <laughs> yeah, terrifies me. Something's about to pop if that's happening. Yeah. Um, I disagree with Marama on this, um, happily, because I love you, Marama. Uh, <laughs> That 46, it is 46% of foreign investment, actually. Um, yes, so it's mum and dad investors, whatever that means. Uh, mum and dad, you know, owners of houses, whatever that means. But, you know, 46% of that money is offshore money or foreign investment money. And that's why the banks have put the brake, brakes on it. So we have got a big issue there. Like the so, uh, yeah, we've got, a, we've got a massive problem unfolding in front of us. Mike, when the property market pops, what does National do? runs for cover. I don't, they have no plan for what will happen because the, the problem will be that this will be a gigantic impact on the economy as a whole. Well, yeah. the, the only thing they can do is try to A, prop up the banks or maintain the banking system or the yeah. financial system. I've just been to Ireland. Yep. I've seen what happens yeah. when, when you get a, a, a property, uh, property boom associated with artificial economic growth and yep. investment and that subsequently collapses and now there's just widespread homelessness, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people facing a, a crisis situation and the housing stock being sold off to vulture funds and, yeah, and so yeah, on. It's, yeah, just a, it's, yeah. ju it's, it's a social, economic and political disaster that is, that is waiting and nothing is being done. The Reserve Bank is tinkering with it in the most... Yeah, yeah. most 
what the what because the, they don't want to pop the, it, do they? They don't want to no, pop no, it. No, because it's because it's been created by the complete freedom of the banks to create as much debt mm. as they mm. want or yep. that people are willing to take. And we and we have in a worldwide situation relatively low interest rates and a lot of money available abroad, so the banks can get it from abroad. So because they're the ones who are, who are actually bringing the money yeah. in yeah, to yeah. lend to, to the, the, to the, the, yeah, the yeah. investors, foreign or otherwise, the people mm. who are buying mm. invest, investor properties. And so there's just this giant, giant sort of thing that is happening and feeding a market that is unsustainable. So John, John, nothing, nothing was sorted from the crisis of capitalism in 2008. Europe is in trouble with the Brexit. Russia is saber rattling because of low oil prices. China's stock market is in dangerous territory again. And America's entire economy relies on low interest rates that spook the market if they ever suggested it go up. A pop in one place is going to cause a trigger effect on the rest, won't it? I'm sure it will. But I think we, you know, so many of those things are outside our immediate control. I think yep. what, what New Zealand should be doing, what our government should be doing is first priority, roll up their sleeves and begin building houses mm. for families that, that, that need them. We've done mm. this in the past. We should be doing it now. It's not a great cost on, on the economy. It's money which is borrowed and paid back by tenants when they, when they um, tenant those houses. Only the government can do this to, to address the crisis we have. Um, the government can borrow money much more cheaply than any private sector yep. organisation, any company. They can use economies of scale to build a large number of high quality but, but relatively cheap homes for, 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 for families to live in. Um, and, and, you know, the government, um, you know, there's, the private sector will never do that. Pri you know, the market will never build houses for families on low incomes. They haven't done it for the last 20 years. Why would Why they, would they expect that? to do them now? That's right, that's right. Point I would we are doing it. Yeah. Uh, we, ha we have to wrap the show. We have to wrap the show. Before we go, final word from our guest, Rachel, your final word this week. Um, my message is to the government, you're gone. You're gone when you have marae, community gardens, gangs feeding homeless people, yeah. looking after homeless people. That's yeah. when you're gone. So, you know, count your days, boys. John Minto, your final word, please. My final word is to say that um, just a huge big ups to those people who, who, who are rolling their sleeves up and doing something about it, like the people who are running, running the Tipukuya Marae yeah. out in Mangere there. Sure you know, great, sure people, great, great Kiwi. Manama, your final word? Uh, listen, we're all on the same boat with this one. Uh, Manurewa Marae, um, yeah. Te Puia Marae, Huani Waititi yeah. Marae all opened their doors um, to the homeless and doing a better job than the state. How insane is uh, that? But if you're watching, they need support. They don't need clothing. They don't need blankets. They need money and they need uh, food. So if there's give a little pages mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. and one other place that needs food, probably more, but the Masterton Food Bank in Wairarapa, their cupboards are bare and have been for a long time. So um, if you can get down there and give Masterton Food Bank a bit of a hand, please do. We'll be coming round with a trailer in the next couple of weeks. Amen. Mike, your final word? The state or this state or this government wants to use this crisis to privatise social services and other things in terms of accessing it. There is an alternative and that's what I call people's power. So we need to empower communities to solve the problems themselves, not privatise it, not sell it off to big business and all the rest of it. We need cooperative community involvement and empowerment, and we can find solutions to these problems. Amen. Thank you, panel. To my final word this week, some will argue that we should welcome the US warship because it won't likely have nuclear weapons on board. They would say this shows a success of policy. They would frame any opposition as just anti-Americanism. I call several shades of bullshit on that. This isn't about a four-decade-old nuclear-free policy that helped define us as an independent people. This is about the here and the now and whether we have the same courage displayed in 1987. Right now, the US are trying to force us into a forced trade deal. The TPPA robs New Zealand of our political and economic sovereignty. We cannot must not allow easy passage for this, ob one, uh, this abomination. We can't willingly allow this government to sell our actual democracy over to corporate overlords who have the ability to sue us if we threaten their profit margin. A US warship being floated into a New Zealand harbour while that nation is currently attempting to steal our economic and political sovereignty must be protested against. 
with every fibre of our ability. Thank you, panellists. Thank you, Fano, for watching. We'll join you again Monday, 7pm, next week for Waitia Fifth Estate. Kia ora and good night. Waitia Fifth Estate is brought to you by ACU, the Aotearoa Credit Union.